Let's go ahead and get things started. Thanks everyone for tuning in to today's webinar. We're really excited to be talking about a different aspect of alternative fuels and transportation that often doesn't get nearly enough at, much attention as it deserves. So today we're going to be talking about preparing maintenance facilities for lighter than air fuels. So a lot of this discussion is going to focus on natural gas and how to prepare maintenance facilities for its deployment and implementation. And today, with us, we have two very special guests, both very knowledgeable in the field. Corey Miller is an application manager with Sierra Monitor Company, which is a market leader in facilities management systems. And Mark Butler is with us as well, who is the project manager and technical advisor to the City of Los Angeles General Services Fueling Group. He's done retrofits on dozens of buildings to facilitate repair of natural gas vehicles and constructed over 20 CNG and LCNG stations. And my name is Matt Stevens Rich. I'm projects manager with Clean Fuels Ohio, where we also work in alternative fuels and transportation here in the Buckeye State. So we work very closely with Sierra Monitor Company and we're really excited to do this webinar. So with that very quick introduction, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Corey and Mark. If you guys are on the line, you can go ahead and yep. get things started. Uh, thank you, Matt, very much. This is Corey Miller. And Mark, you want to say hello? And uh, Good afternoon. <laughs> right. So for the next several minutes, I appreciate you guys taking your time to, to listen to us. Uh, as Matt indicated, Mark and I kind of get excited about this area. So if we get a little enthusiastic, uh, forgive us. Uh, I know Mark and I both work the same way. If you have any questions, please ask it immediately. It helps us, um, and we can help you. So, getting started. And thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> Go ahead. Thanks Matt. for bringing that up, Mark. Too. I'll, I'll quickly interject. For those of you not familiar with GoToWebinar software, there is a questions tab on that right-hand panel. So feel free to type up any questions. We'll address some as we go, but we will also do a full dedicated Q&A after the fact as well. So I'll keep monitoring that. Excellent. Thank you, Matt. So, uh, there we go. So as anything with an agenda today, we're going to uh, provide some insight and promote discussion on what it will take to prepare a maintenance facility for alternative fuel vehicles. As Matt indicated, we're going to look at lighter than air uh, fuel, but we're going to also look at some of the others. We're going to try to define the alternative fuels as anything that's non-gasoline or diesel, which includes CNG compressed natural gas. LNG liquefied natural gas, LPG liquid petroleum gas, hydrogen and fuel cells. The CNG emblems, as you see across the bottom. We're going to review the hazardous natures of these fuels because that helps set the tone for what we're going to be talking about later. We're going to go through the various codes and ordinances that have influenced the design of these facilities. We're going to look at the equipment that's commonly used in the operation of these systems, which includes detection, alarming, heaters, mitigation or fans, and then finally we're going to look at some of the cost of ownership. So what is a maintenance facility? Well, it's a vehicle repair garage, and it can be something as, as large as this facility here. It can be specific to include uh, man pits. It can also include other vehicles that are using alternative fuels as well, as we see a, a refuge truck here and a conventional truck. Yeah, it's too many. Yeah, it. So what are the alternative fuels we're talking about? As Matt said, it's natural gas. And so you guys all know it's methane. Chemical name, CH4. It is what you see in your kitchen. It is what cooks in many places. It is used as a vehicle, as a fuel for vehicles. When I say 100% LEL, I mean that that's the level it takes of gas to be explosive, or what we call the low explosive level. That's 5% by volume. So it takes 5% by volume to achieve that level in a given area. It is a fuel that is lighter than air, so it's not going to stay on the ground. It's going to try to seek the highest point in a facility or in an area. It is odorless, guys. The smell that you smell in your house is added to that gas. Real natural gas does not smell. CNG stands for compressed natural gas, up to 4,000 PSI. Liquefied natural gas is really cold, minus 260 degrees Fahrenheit. That's how we liquefy it. Another fuel that we're starting to see is hydrogen. 
it has a 4% by volume explosive level or 100% LEL. It is much lighter than air and again it will seek the highest point in the area. It is also odorless and is used as a fuel in two methods, combustion in an engine and also to generate electricity in a fuel cell. Another alternative fuel that we're seeing very popular is propane. Propane is much, it doesn't take nearly as much at only 2.1 percent by volume to be explosive. It is heavier than air so it will follow the ground. It is also odorless in its natural form. And it's liquefied for storage or transportation but gaseous for combustion. Now let's take a look at some of the codes and regulations that are used for the design of these facilities. First there are two entities that we deal with. The first one is International Code Council and it develops the fire code that we see a lot of municipalities, districts and other entities adopting for code. The first one is a fire code and the specific section that governs what we're looking for is under section 2311.7. Some of the key points is that it requires gas detection for non-odorized gases and those systems will be performance approved. This is also reiterated in the International Mechanical Code as well as in the International Building Code. Another entity is the National Fire Protection Association or NFPA for short. They have several areas, but one specific that we look at for in terms of code recommendation. First is NFPA 30A. The most recent released version is 2015. Within this code, there are terms used for repair of a garage using major or minor repair. This definition comes from NFPA 70, or what you may know as the National Electric Code. It specifies that the top 18 inches of a facility will become class 1 div 1 in the event that you are utilizing natural or lighter than air fuels. It also says within that area that if we have enough air changes we can unclassify the area. This has become important and Mark will allude to that in a little while. Some of the other code recommendations from the NFPA include NFPA 30A as I mentioned, NFPA 52 is which is the criteria we use for the design of our fuel systems. NFPA 59 is for utility LP gas. A new one we're starting to see come around is NFPA 72 and this is also helping steer some of our design for these systems. This is the National Fire Alarm and Signaling Code. Finally for our repair structures we're looking at NFPA 88A. Here's my legal get out of jail card. Basically it says essentially that the ICC and the NFPA, the International Code Council and the National Fire Protection Agency only draft recommendations. It isn't until the local state or entity adopts that as a law does it become law. So you, when you see these code recommendations you absolutely must check as I say in the second bullet with your local authority having jurisdiction to see what code they're using and what code they understand and follow. So let's take a look for a few minutes at some of the design characteristic considerations. First of all, the, th the funny part about this, or I should say the most important part about this is the kind of work that's being conducted in our facility, whether it's major or minor. Now I'm going to point to Mark at this point because uh, Mark has kind of a story to tell you as, a, as, as we use a definition of major minor. Mark? Right. Okay, so uh, in dealing with uh, you know the, the different uh, areas uh, for repair that we have and the, and the the end user, so say we'll we'll use a, a CNG sweeper as as a, an example. We had to have a meeting with the, the the operators and the fire department at the head of the fire department. So uh, he's the he's the head engineer. He deals with all of the acceptance of anything that you're going to do with regards to alternative fuels, whether it be fueling facilities or major or, or, or uh, maintenance facilities. And at that meeting, he stated, if you have to pull out a wrench of any kind to work on that facility, it's considered major. major. There's no such thing as minor with regards to how, how you're going to repair or work on a vehicle. 
So, so that's just uh, just a note to everybody. Uh, your local jurisdiction may, you know, have a different view on it, but uh, with regards to the city of Los Angeles, that's the stance that we have we have taken. Now, I've seen that exactly the same thing. This is Corey again. Carried over to many of the other municipalities. Uh, we had the opportunity to work on one of the facilities there in Ohio for Central Ohio Transit Authority. And the life safety inspector, uh, he was pretty much on the same line as Mark. Uh, he made some exceptions to doing tire changes, um, but anything else he said that, that could potentially cause a release of gases was going to be considered major. So. That being said, you guys need to work, as Mark said, with the local authority having jurisdiction to see what they have as a definition. The second consideration is under NFPA 52 and now under NFPA 30A, it tells you that you must solicit the services of a qualified engineer for the design. I can tell you and Mark can tell you both, many times we get phone calls from people that say, hey, I need you to help me design a system, okay? We can give you recommendations, we can give you precedents, but we're not going to be the guys that are going to stamp that drawing. Is that true, Mark? That's true. Yeah, yeah. and and even some of the the engineers that haven't actually worked in that field that are are part of that, uh, they ask us for guidance. Uh, we've had uh, we've had people come from all over the world to some to see some of our facilities, and we like that. We we I have an open door policy here in the city of Los Angeles. Anybody who wants to come and see what we've done. Uh, feel free. We'll set up, uh, you know, uh, organized meetings with you. Give you, all, provide you with all the information that we have at this at this time and what we've done for the last uh, almost 19 years now. Well, there you go, guys. An open invitation to come to Disneyland. No, no, I'm kidding. I mean, come to Los Angeles, and while you're here, you could go to Disneyland. But anyway, so we we want to emphasize that it does require us to to solicit the services of a qualified engineer. We also consider the building structure itself. I can tell you that there's a building that Mark has um, that has a scissor, I don't know how, to, a sawtooth roof design. Uh, and here I'll let Mark talk about that one a little bit because that became quite a quite a, a potential problem in design, Mark. Right. So we had a sawtooth building that, uh, as far as uh, having detection and everything else goes, it, it just did not work out. Uh, it would have been so expensive, and, and the building itself was probably built in the 20s. Uh, we had no way to, to put attached ducting to it, no structural plan. So we ended up, for, for in this case, we ended up building them a 230 by 40 canopy for them to take some of these uh, vehicles that they would be working on at you know, out outside uh, to to repair. We we put all reels and electric and everything else for them, but there was just no way that we could have uh, converted that building. So those are the things you have to look at uh, with regards to your engineer, your structural engineer, on the design uh, for the facilities that you're looking at. So again, uh, emphasizing building structure. Is there natural natural ventilation? This is a big asset. Uh, if you can get and utilize the natural innovation ventilation in a facility, um, that's a huge huge plus for you. That'll help you uh, uh, mitigate any problems that maybe come up. Surrounding buildings. Who are your neighbors? What are the other buildings around? What consideration do you have for those? Uh, you have to take a look at what's going on with your neighbor next door. Security. I always tell a little story of a facility I did in San Bernardino where the way they made up the air was to roll the garage doors up in order to make up the air that the exhaust fans were using. Well, that sounds all great and fancy, and the problem was that when, the, when they had a gas release at 2 o'clock in the morning, the doors all rolled up and promptly all the tools for the mechanics rolled out the doors. So they went back in with a redesign and came up with some louvers that they put into the walls that precluded any kind of, of a security issue. So security becomes important. Occupation. How often is it occupied? Is it 24-7? Is it eight hours a day? That type of consideration. Where are the ignition sources? This is one of the biggest discussions we have, and again, an ignition short doesn't necessarily mean an electrical or a flame. It could be from a grinder. I know that we shunt trip a lot of the uh, equipment in our facilities here in Los Angeles, but we have if you have an air grinder, you need to consider putting a valve on that air cylinder to keep it from operating as well. So heaters, grinders, and welding areas. 
And then finally, where you are geographic and climate consideration. Mark and I take a look at the fact that in Southern California, we don't store our vehicles under a roof. We store them outside. Well, there's a good reason for that. It never rains in Southern California. True. But it's not something you might consider in Minneapolis or Columbus or even Cleveland. You might store that vehicle inside. So it has to be a consideration of what you're doing. So let's take a few minutes and talk about gas detection. Essentially, there are two deployments of uh, alternatives in gas detection. Portable, the use of a portable detector device. You would see these a lot of times on your firemen, this type of thing. These are normally not accepted as a gas detection in a fixed facility. The alternative is a fixed gas detection device that's permanently mounted. Within the world of fixed gas detection, we deal with two types of gas detection, a controller-based system or a sensor-based system. Controller-based system, as you see in the picture here, has a centralized controller. So a pro to that is that it has a centralized controller or a single point for a, for a first responder or a supervisor to go to. It's generally easier to install with fewer wires. You can get the whole system approved as a complete system, and it's simpler to calibrate most of the time. The downside to it is that it's size limited. So in other words, you can usually see these limited to no more than, say, 32 or even fewer sensors than that. A controller-based system, as you would see here, the pros to that are the flexibility in the design. Third-party approvals for the sensors only, typically. The downside to that requires data wires and power wires, so you have a, usually a much more wire application. And calibration is generally done at the sensor itself, so it makes it a little bit more cumbersome. There is a third methodology that we're seeing that is kind of a combined hybrid of, an, of gas detection. It's called open path, where you have an infrared signal that's sent from one transmitter to a receiver. This, these devices were developed by gas detection companies such as ourselves for uh, large tank farms for berm monitoring where we wanted to know if there's anything coming over the berm or in large areas where there might be no concern about where the gas detection actually was, but if there was a leak in general like an oil platform or rig. They say they're less costly per area because, and they have fewer components as a positive. The negative is they're no, not really accurate about where that gas is. And as you'll see in just a minute, we'll talk about, in terms of the measurement, how difficult that is. They are also very difficult to install in terms of alignment. It takes quite a bit of time to get these aligned. And if they're juggled out of position, or if they're moved, then they become non-operational. And there is, not, there is quite a few local authorities that do not accept this type of gas detection. Yeah, and part of the problem, I'll just, this is Mark, Mark. again, uh, that, that to give you a, a situation most of your buildings uh, that you're dealing with they have cranes in them so that's, a, that's something that's moving so so to have a, uh, that line of sight never interrupted is almost impossible so uh, we've, we've steered clear from from this method uh, for that reason alone and you have no means in which to know at what area that that uh, you may have that catastrophic release you just don't so uh, we, we stay clear of those uh, just for that reason. But for out in the refinery areas and things like that, yeah, it's a, it's a good method. Yeah, and again, like, let's just on segue into what Mark is saying. The reality of an open path is that it does not read an LEL. All of our codes are based on we, might, we have to do some type of an action at 25% LEL. An open path device reads in an LEL meter. So it's telling you how much gas is given in a specific distance. Now, if you look here, you have 5% LEL, which is well below the explosive level in 20 meters. That would be a 1 LEL meter. On the same token, you take 100% LEL in 1 meter. Guys, that's 1 LEL meter, too, and this is explosive. So it becomes kind of confusing as to understanding what the explosive levels are versus a, a non-explosive level. This is where this becomes a problem. So let's look at the specific sensor technologies that we talk about other than open path. First of all, the most common scene in the world is the catalytic bead sensor. 
It is a two wires on it that that one each of them has a catalytic bead attached, and one of them ha is a reference. The other is used to measure the gas as the gas attacks the bead. It changes resistance and gives us a, a amount of gas proportional to that particular uh, um, reading. A newer technology that we're seeing, I say newer, it's been around probably 20, 25 years, is infrared technology. You have a beam of light that is passed from a transmitter to a receiver. This is all located within the actual element itself. And that light is then diminished proportionally to the amount of gas that it's looking for. When we start talking about toxics, and I know this is off a little bit about the original subject, but for example, a lot of our facilities are starting to see CO, or in the case where they might have diesel around, they have NO2 sensors. The type of technology there is electrochemical. And there are coming all kinds of varieties. So as I mentioned before with the catalytic bead, we have a passive bead, we have an active bead, and as it's attacked by gas, the resistance is proportional to the amount of gas. Something important here, guys, is that these devices all need to be approved by a nationally recognized task laboratory. One of those that's specifically called out in the code recommendations is UL2075. Now this sensor technology requires at least a 90 day or in some cases 180 day recalibration. So every half year or every quarter you're going to have somebody out there calibrating that sensor. Infrared by, by contrast looks only at the lighter hydrocarbons. Guys it's important to know you cannot use infrared to read hydrogen. It won't work. It should be located within 18 inches of the ceiling. It needs to be performance approved and it should it is very accurate and stable. It also has a one year calibration interval. Finally, the electrochemical technology is nothing more than a, an elaborate battery. And as the gases get in between the dielectric plates, the proportional voltage changes. That's how we measure them. The important thing to understand is that these sensors are located normally in the breathe zone, anywhere from four to seven feet. And they measure in parts per million. So you won't see them measure in LEL. So let's take a look. It's a little hard to see, but you can see an actual sensor located right here in the ceiling. Now, I always stop here because we're going to get into the cost of ownership in a minute, but Mark and I have talked about this. Mark, you want to elaborate on how in Los Angeles we use four changes of error to declassify, and then I'll expand on what we did here. Yes. Um, what, what, we've, what we've done is because uh, we, we've done a method of called declassifying the building, and so rather than, and, and we do that with air exchange, and that's what the electrical code actually allows that, so that we uh, we don't uh, have to have the sensors going off, you know, inadvertently, and we don't have to convert the buildings electrically over to uh, all explosion proof uh, within the 18 inches uh, from the ceiling, and it's a method that we we started with and we stick with, so we have the automatic four air exchanges within the building, um, and within that we can actually introduce uh, uh, external fired heating elements that uh, that we can use to temper the the temperature within the building, and so that has been quite successful. But but it, it is it is not the only way, but it is one way that you can actually uh, you know not have to convert your building all to explosion proof. Now, adding to that, this facility that you're looking at currently is actually in Ohio, and this is a 300,000 square foot bus storage facility. And as Mark said, you can do alternatives. The choice was not to have to put four changes of air in here and warm it. That's a lot of air. So the choice was to actually lower all the conduits and all those that didn't meet the code. And one of the important things that we did to save cost and in installation was we ran the sensors in the upper 18 inches as defined by the building code, but we ran all the lateral the, the lateral structures were in EMT or non-explosion proof, and then we teed up through a seal off into the explosion proof area. This saved a significant cost on the installation of this system. By the way, there's 395 sensors in this this, this structure, <laughs> so you get a better picture here of how we did that. 
Here is actually a controller on the wall. What's important to note here is a battery backup, um, the charger for that. And right here, this brown cabinet actually contains all the calibration tubes for this 32 sensors that are located on this controller. And this allows a technician every year to come in here, attach his, his uh, calibration gases right here, and send gases up to the sensors without having to disrupt the bus operation or the traffic or any of the normal operation in this facility that can all be done right here, and it reduces calibration time significantly. Yeah, and this is a gr big recommendation uh, um, on my part because uh, we, you know, we do have a lot of facilities and the calibration method uh, sometimes can uh, disrupt the facility, so this is, this is pretty much the, the way to do it. And so, moving on, here's an actual CO sensor. It's located about six foot off the ground, just to give you an idea what a CO sensor might look like. Here's a sensor mounted in a facility handling LNG. This is mounted down low. Mark, you want to interject as to why we would put a sensor down low? I know you and I have had conversations about this, but well, they they because liquefied natural gas, uh, the liquid state, it will hit the ground and then it turns to a gas immediately. So the conversation was that uh, we would have at least 20% uh, of exhaust and and censoring at at that level. We we now are not doing the. Uh, doing the centering, but uh, we still do the 20% exhaust at, at that level. So uh, this maybe was a bit of an overkill, but for that jurisdiction, I'm sure that's what the uh, fire department decided they wanted to do. Thank you, Mark. Yep. Now, there is a requirement when you're dealing with LNG facilities, uh, or I'm sorry, LNG vehicles at, that, that would be maintained in these facilities, that if you have a man pit, you notice this pit here would allow for human access you will have detection in those. That's an important thing because we had a design change in Los Angeles on one of those. You want to expand on that, Mark, a little bit. Right, right. And the clarification became whether or not you would access the pit because a lot of your lifts, you know, they consider those a pit, but uh, they're not accessible, you know, with, with a human. So uh, that atmosphere down there, which is all oil and everything, is not conducive to a, to having to detect detector below. So in this case, it's a, it's a pit that they can walk down. So uh, if you were to have the release, the release uh, LNG itself would hit the floor and set that sensor off. That would that would turn off all the, your your, uh, your shunt trip, all your electrical power, removing condition sources so that uh, you wouldn't have a catastrophic problem. Thank you, Mark. So let's talk about some of the design considerations in the sensor technology area. The first thing is sensor location. This is one of the things that I know Mark and I both get asked about. Um, where do I put my sensors and how many? That's really a subjective answer. <laughs> yeah. Or, or, well, yeah. Mark, you want to expand on that one? Sure. Um, we we look at as far as design goes. Where's the vehicle? You know, where are you repairing the vehicle? Uh, that's why uh, most of the time, and everybody has an assigned bay. There's a lift there, that, and and so we use that as kind of the the uh, the point that we believe if there was ever to be a release, and what, you know, you've got uh, pressure relief valves. Some would release earlier than later, and in most cases, that release is done uh, through a vented pipe up up closer to the top of the vehicle. So that would send it automatically to, to the ceiling. So, so we're looking at, at if your vehicle is there, you're going to be working on a vehicle there, that is where you would have a sensor. And that's an that's excellent just, point. That's right. fine. And again, that's a good, a good advice. I mean, as a design engineer, you want to look from a common sense standpoint, where are you going to be fueling? Where are you going to be working on that vehicle? So now the other thing I'm going to stop here and interject, because I talked to Mark about this quite a bit, and one of the things that we are understanding from, from the Midwest is that there's been some discussion regarding deluge systems, uh, specifically in fueling areas. And I realize that it doesn't have much to do with the maintenance facility, but I thought we'd take a few minutes, if Matt doesn't have an issue, and talk about deluge systems and Mark's experience, because he's actually done studies. And I'm going to turn it over to him and talk about deluge systems for a few minutes. Sure. The conversation that we've had, and I've had this with this extensively with fire departments, and it's uh, the, the deluge system for an LNG fire or any kind of, of natural gas fire, it doesn't seem to do what your, your intention is because what would happen is you end up increasing the vapor. The water will increase the vapor 
and so where the fire will travel along that vapor and end up someplace else. Uh, we don't we don't do it. It's it's one of those. Um, uh, we've done the, the testing, we've seen the problem, we've seen exactly what has happened to it, and once the fire department has realized what that was, that they've kind of gone in the opposite direction and going, okay, so what do we do? And in most cases, you'd be surprised, we let it burn. You're not going to put it out unless you have a, a, a the product, it's called Purple K, and you have enough to completely uh, sum, you know, submerge the, the flame in, uh, it's, gonna, it's just going to burn. Uh, we don't like indoor fueling. I know you guys do, uh, but but that's that's the case. And so it's it's a problem. You, you that's another one of those things you have to deal with your your local jurisdiction, whoever has that that responsibility. Uh, but in the design, especially with the engineers, they they've now started to realize that that the water and LNG and CNG fires do not work. You remove all the other combustible things, but the the product itself, you're not you're not going to put it out with the uh, with uh, uh, you know the the, the actual water because it increases the vapor vapor cloud. Thank you, Mark. So spacing, as we mentioned, another thing is height, guys. We're dealing with a fuel that's lighter than air. That means that it's going to seek the highest point in any particular area that's captured, and that could be a fuel island, that could be a, re a, a bus wash, that could be a a, a repair facility, it could be a storage facility. So you want to make sure that you have the sensor at the highest point. I was told of a story of where a design engineer wanted to cut costs, so they were going to use a sensor that, w that was non-classified class 1 div 1. Well, they decided they would have to locate that lo below the class 1 div 1 div 2 environment, so the sensors were located 24 inches below the ceiling. What they were saying was essentially they were going to allow that facility to fill up with 24 inches of natural gas before they indicated it. You got to think about what you're doing. That's is very important. So yeah, custom, I like them. I like them within six inches. I like them within six inches of the highest point. Yeah. That's that's just me. And this and so in, in some of the designs of the building where you have a lot of glass areas and things like that, that is where the gas is going to accumulate, guaranteed. So yeah. if if you don't have a, a sensor up in there to let you know that that's what happened, if it's 40 feet away, you have to think of that. There's going to be that much gas to get that 40 feet away, and by the time that happens, you've 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 already got a, a problem, so your ventilation system is going to be working overtime, and, and you're just hoping that you don't have an ignition source that sets it off. Thanks, Mark. Yep. So propane, on the other hand, may be down low. So you may have a gas detection that's down low enough on the garage, the lower 18 inches, or even in the pit areas. For toxics, we talk about carbon monoxide and nitrogen dioxide, and we put those into the breeze zone. And finally, the one thing we always stress, Mark and I both, is using common sense for the location. Just like we mentioned before, where are you fueling, what are you doing, where are you working on it? So let's talk for a minute about alarms and notification. If you read the actual code, it doesn't tell you that you have to evacuate. It says that you need to alarm at 25% LEL. Well, that has been interpreted in many different directions. But it's a notification to the local authority, uh, to the local personnel that you have a problem and you need to resolve it. So at 25%, you need to do have some type of an alarm that indicates something to somebody. Most local authorities having jurisdictions will require that all alarms be visual from all points and audible to all. This has become a big thing with ADA compliance, so that if you're blind, you can hear it. If you're deaf, you can see it. The other thing we've started doing, this is with Mark's help, is we started getting into the first res responder intuitive design. So in essence, we were putting systems in that had a red, amber, and green light. And when it goes to the amber, the fans would come on and would try to mitigate the gas. If the gas continued to build, it would go to red, and that system latched at red so that it had to be addressed at a high level. It happens to be 40% for our systems, but then if the fans did mitigate the gas and we had no combustion, it would then come back below the safety level. What we did to tell the first responders about safety is we left the red light on and alternated the green light, making it first responder intuitive. This came in on a lot of the designs we have for the city of Los Angeles. So if you rolled up to any of our facilities as a first responder and you saw a red light and a green light fast flashing, you knew you had an alarm, but you know it's now safe to return. Any comments, Mark, on that? 
No, and and th that's uh, with you know as large as the city of Los Angeles is when these guys come up and and they're all ready to rock and roll and they pull their axes out and everything, which we tell them <laughs> to leave on the truck. But they they do. They want to know what what the problem is, and uh, you know if, if there's not an issue, uh, if the door. If, a lot of times they're coming up when these doors are locked and whatever, and and having that, just having that information with the light and it's very visible as they pull in, uh, it, it's it's definitely saved us uh, a lot of money in repairs for doors. Absolutely, thank you, Mark. Yep. We need evacuation if required. I put on here if required because I have had situations where they don't want to evacuate. I haven't figured out why, but um, there there are some facilities that will not evacuate. Well, let me. Here, I'll, I'll, ex ahead, I'll, expand, I'll expand on that. So, every every uh, building, you know, that that I know of has an evacuation plan. So, whoever your safety person is, whoever that person that controls that and and sets up your map and where you're supposed to meet and everything, all of these things need to be worked out with him because that initial evacuation, whatever that may be, wherever you're going to go, that needs to be looked at. Uh, and have that part of your evacuation plan. So when there's when there's alarm, where do you go? Where do you meet? That's all taken care of by usually your safety engineer. And those, that's a person when you start to, to to do these upgrades in your in your uh, your buildings. That's one of the people you need to bring in kind of early so that he has a full understanding of what it is you're doing. Well, and exactly. And again, it may be not like a fire situation where you send them over. You know, so you don't send them to the fuel island as a safety area. Uh, you may see them yeah. to some places a lot more safe than that. So, one of the things that we do know is that we're starting to see that for the gas detection, we handle that differently than a fire. We handle that with mitigation, where fire we would try to suffocate. We want to make sure the audios and visuals are different than a fire alarm, so that the local participant or local entities know what's actually happening. Auto dialers where required. Some facilities, all of the facilities in Los Angeles are going to be centrally stationed and they're going to be monitored by the fire authority. So they get an alarm at 40% LEL telling them that there has been an, an, a gas excursion and they roll the fire department. So here's a, an example of one of those trees I mentioned. This has got the green light illuminated, safe. You've got the horn to the right of it. You've got an amber light in the middle and a red. Another one, as you can see here. They also can be as simple as a blue with a white. And what's important here is signage. And Mark, I know you want to talk about how important <laughs> signage is. Yeah, so. make sure that the that the signage, when people walk by it, they can see it. They don't have to take their glasses out of their pocket and squint and say, "What does that say?" So you, you yeah. So uh, this was like maybe a, a less expensive way to go but but yeah you need the signage and in training on on what what every one of those devices uh mean and and uh, that should be done uh more than just one time it should, when personnel changes you know uh your safety people should be uh coming through and doing maybe uh you know uh, train the trainer uh situations for the people that are there to, to make sure that they understand and uh, it's their responsibility to know this. We we have actually uh, sign-in sheets that say that you have been trained and we, we make everybody sign in so that there's not an, uh, an issue of one of your employees coming and saying, hey, we weren't trained. So those are just things that we've, we've discovered over the years. Yeah, I to segue off that a little bit. I mentioned NFPA 72 earlier. One of the things that we're starting to see is that these devices, these horns and strobes, are all starting requirement for supervision. So I, I, I know Mark and I both feel the same way. Don't ask the fire authority. We suggest you tell the fire authority um, what you're going to do. Have a plan. Uh, this is a part of the design consideration. But NFPA 72, and that's in Section 17 under Initiating Devices, you'll start to see some of the requirements for supervision. That can add a bit of cost to your install, so you'll want to keep an eye out for that. Yep. So finally, the biggest solution we have for mitigating or for get rid of the gases out of our garage is our mitigation. It is we want to try to make sure we use all the natural airflow we can, doors, whatever it is. We want to have the response recoveries that we can. We want to pressurize the office areas. Mark, you want to expand on the savings that can get get you? Sure, uh, because what you have to do is you have to have more of a positive pressure in your areas with self-closing doors. Because when you have a, a release, uh, 
the areas that you have that are air conditioned, obviously offices and things like that, they have electronic devices, they have, they have starters, they have certain things for AC units, uh, light switches and everything. So you want to make sure that those areas are, are under positive pressure and then when you do your air, ba air balance test, you, you can test that. Uh, what we've done and on the retrofits now, rather than to redo the whole office space, is we just put a small corridor which is basically an, just an entrance with a door and a door. That's the only area that we have to pressurize, and we don't. We, that way, we don't have to worry about the rest of the office space because doing that can get far more expensive than just having just a small little corridor with a door and a door as you pass through to pressurize. Excellent. Evacuation of the air, guys. I always bring this one up because the, in a push-pull design, which we'll look at here in a second, your exhaust fans need to be uh, explosion-proof. This is probably some of the bigger costs that you're going to see associated with a retrofit, because the exhaust fans normally are TFC. That doesn't make them explosion-proof, so that needs to be considered on the exhaust fans. Production of air, makeup air. Within the city of Los Angeles, we do not roll the doors up. We use makeup air. Mark can talk to you for hours about the different types of makeup air we have. Uh, uh, in fact, why don't you expand, Mark, a little bit on what some of the types we use, because I know we use boiler and we use gas and everything. Well, and for, for the boiler, we're talking about heating. So when we, when we do produce our makeup air, we, we can go ahead and use that to, to heat the building if we need to heat the building. We don't really air condition the buildings, but, uh, but with, the, if, with the, the movement of the air, it actually works as some kind of a cooling device. But uh, because of our security issues, we just we cannot allow just to have the the, the doors roll up at at a, at a specific uh, level at LEL level. We do, we don't do that. So we do uh, provide a makeup air system uh, for for the entire facility. So uh, that is an additional cost. Whether or not you go that direction, it's not necessarily. But you do have to have air coming in at basically at the bottom of, of your your facility for six inches would would have to have some type of uh, openings that and and noticeable air balance that would allow your your exhaust fans to work efficiently because if you just put an exhaust fan in a closed door building you're you're just going to suck the doors in so that's not going to work so you, so yep. you do have to have a means you do we've seen it <laughs> i've seen people I just, say we've seen it happen so yeah, i've seen it happen so so those are the things that that you know you you lead, need to look at early with your design engineer on what method are you going to have to for, for your evacuation air and we have a we have a set set plan. Uh, we like five air exchanges, you know, to get it going. And what we do is we have we run two speeds or VFD exhaust fans that that double that. So at at the low for declassification, we have it at one level. But if you have a release and it goes to 40 percent, we have a, a, we almost double the the exhaust. So there you go. That's a fairly common practice. It is, as I said before. A push-pull design. So you're going to be pulling fresh air in, and you're going to be pushing the bad air out. And as it says within the code, air is 100% cubic feet per minute of outside air. And that's exactly where it comes up with this information that Mark was saying about the four to five changes of air per hour. So there's two modes of operation, as Mark said. There's the normal, 24 hours a day, or low fan speed. And then we have the emergency high, and it's activated by the gas detection system of more than 20% or more. Air volume requirements by code one cubic uh, one yes cubic foot per cu twelve cubic feet of room area, and that's a minimum for the NFPA 52. Right, and you only know that that you're working efficiently, and this is something that's this part of your design system is that you must provide an air balance report to show that you have accomplished this. Excellent. So you can't just have one little fan and say we're good. No, you, the entire volume of the area actually has to have that air exchange. So here we have an example of an exhaust going out the roof. And as Mark mentioned earlier, we said 20% down low. This is an example of where we have an exhaust down low. But that's only required for liquefied natural gas, not, that's not, correct. not, not CNG. But that's, right. the, that's the down low one. Here's an example of what the VFDs would look like in one of our facilities as well as the makeup air unit that we have. 
here you can see it as an example of makeup error. We don't actually do it in LA, but it shows one of the LA buildings with the doors rolled open. And the alternative is louvers on the wall. And those can be mechanical or electrical. Right. So let's talk for a minute about heaters. Actually, the first and only rule of thumb is no open flames. You have to shut the gas off, either the pilot or the striker, in the event of a release. And one of the most common gas heaters we see is this, this type here, this max heater. It's a no-no. As an alternative, they offer these C and G rated heaters. And what that means, Mark? Yeah, <laughs> it's just a radiant. It's not, it, it, yeah, they're not a very efficient, but uh, we do see them around. We don't, we don't use them. We use uh, external fired heaters that we, that we use for, through our makeup air units. Right. Or we use uh, boiler systems, you know, that, uh, that have gas shutoffs. But the, the boiler system is relatively efficient because it's, uh, and we can re just run that past the coils and, and use the makeup air unit to, to push the heat into the building. I, I know at one COTA facility we actually used radiant on the floor where they were using a boiler to generate heat through the floor and, that, yep, and that, the mechanics really like that. That's a really good one, yep. Yeah. Now this, the actual rule when it comes to this is that the surface temperature can't be above 750 degrees Fahrenheit. That makes it a CNG qualified heating system. Yep. So additional considerations, vents and over doors, shunt tripping and shutdowns. Mark and I talk about this all the time. You have to think about where an ignition source would come from. You want to add a little bit to that, Mark? Yeah, most of the time we just identify it. And, and everything that is, is with the uh, makeup air units and the exhaust systems, uh, they are already uh, you know, explosion proof. And so the shunt trip would take care of any other devices that you have within the facility that would cause an exist ignition source. So. Uh, you just do that through a main panel. It shunts everything when you when you uh, have your event uh, events over. You go back, reset your shunt, shunt trip, and off you go. Considerations again: explosion proof requirements and signage, signage, signage. You never want these systems to go off, but when you want them to, when they do, you want people to understand. The last element I want to talk about. And I'm going to do this briefly because we're running out of time. Is cost of ownership. When you put one of these systems in, it is a facility maintained system. It's a part of anything else in your facilities and it needs to be on PMs on a regular basis. You need to consider the utility cost that's involved, the moving of the air, the heating of the air. You have to look at the initial equipment costs, that's the explosion proof fans, the gas detection, the makeup air. I think Mark gave me this number and he can expand on it, but typically it runs about this, doesn't it, Mark, per bay? About, yep, what? yep, yep, we're still using that. And so that runs the uh, includes the design and build as well. Yes. Within the cost of ownership is the ongoing maintenance. So the equipment maintenance costs are involved. I usually look at an annual estimate between 25 and 150 bucks per sensor just to calibrate. And that's the reason the higher cost is if you have to move a bus, move a truck, move a car, you have to get a ladder out there, a scissor lift or something, that's going to add cost. And then the strongest thing I recommend on a regular basis, usually annually, is run a full systems test. I know Mark and I were adamant about training with these guys and, and safety and told them they needed to run this just like a fire alarm. Test everything. Make sure your people know what to do the event of an excursion. Finally, safety, guys. That's the big one. In summary, want to make sure that you build your, safe, your, your facilities. I think Mark has the greatest saying, at least he goes home at night and Mark. I sleep, well. I sleep well. I sleep well. So <laughs> if, if I, don't, I don't. I don't have a fear of, of something something happening to another human being because I didn't do my job. Right. So we took a few minutes. We looked at the codes. We looked at the uh, what the fuels are. We looked at the the uh, hazards of these fuels, and then we looked at the systems, and then finally the cost of ownership. All right. I turn to Matt. Is there any questions? Or did we baffle everybody? No, gratefully we do have a couple questions for you guys and I'll give others time if they want to write up any questions again, feel free to enter that into the question tab and we'll be able to pull it from there. Uh, thanks again guys, definitely in depth but it, and actually in turn a lot of these questions are focused a little bit on that depth as well. So let's see, 
So the first question I saw coming through was, sorry, I'm queuing these up here. Um, there was one immediate question on the IFC update for 2018 and mm. allowances for completely defueled CNG vehicles in repair garages. Uh, Corey or, or Mark, uh, would you guys be able to speak to that? Well, first of all, I can I, I, I can talk specifically, this is Corey, about the code's update of 2018. There's some significant changes within the IFC of 2018. Um, more to the case of, of um, that have to do with the equipment selections and this type of thing. Um, one of the other things, as you mentioned, was was the requirement um, um, or, or the possibility of defueling. Now, I have, and I'm going to say this, and then I want Mark to either counter me or, or add to it, I have yet to have found any natural gas vehicle or propane vehicle that when it defueled that all the fuel is actually gone. And, that, and that's correct. And, and that, that is actually how they, our MTA, Metropolitan Transit District, uh, did start uh, doing they would they would take it over, defuel the the vehicle, you know, so you're sucking it all out. Then they have a tow motor that brings it into the facility, and a tow motor that brings it back out. So, uh, and and testing here, here, this is part of the problem. When you're working on a fueling system, you have no means in which to test your your engine with. There's no fuel in a tank, so it hasn't been successful in in everything that I've seen. And we don't do it. So that's uh, but but again. It is there. The code is there. So if you would you would just have to have a fully functioning method in which to make sure that you're you're not actually bringing fuel into the facility because you're you're not uh, censored or anything. And again, I'm going to expand on what Mark just said because our local authority has a uh, has a statement about that. He said to me one afternoon, Corey, if you can guarantee me you that that guy is going to defuel at every time, I'll let you do that. The reality is human nature, guys. Guy says, all I want to do is change that brake pad real quick. I'm going to whip it into the garage and whip it out. Yeah. That's when the problem happens. So that, I hope, answers the question, Matt. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And and uh, definitely when we especially talk codes, man, we could do a whole webinar series that would last the whole year on that. So I appreciate oh, yeah. you guys going into that. Um, let's see. Another question as well was on the ventilation section on operating the entire area in 5ACH and if that would require methane detection. So so I'll state it as a question, which is, if you're operating the area in 5ACH, how does that impact the methane detection need? And also, uh, I guess, does that affect cost of methane detection in other places as well? You want me to take that? Uh, yeah, Mark, <laughs> why don't you start with that yeah. one? Yeah, okay. So so the, the air exchange the continuous air exchange is basically a, an air exchange to declassify the building. That that really isn't uh, wasn't our intent, although it does do exactly what we want it to do. Uh, but you would still the code still states that once you reach a a 25% uh, exposure, then you would you would have to have some means in which to mitigate the gas. So I don't I don't think you you can just use that without a sensor. Yeah, and again, Mark did allude to, there's some things in the code that gives you some out, guys. This is coming from, a, I'm a, a gas detection manufacturer, so uh, you know I'm going to want to to sell you a gas detection, but in reality, uh, Mark and I have talked the fact, we're talking about non-odorized gases. I've got facilities that, do, that, that swear by the fact that it's going to be an odorized gas, so therefore they don't need detection, or they're going to have ventilation, so therefore they don't need detection. It's it's really falls back on your local authority having jurisdiction as to what they feel is going to protect you as an individual and that facility from from a catastrophe. So yeah, I, I can tell you stories when I, I probably spoke at conferences from from way back when in the in the beginning and nobody wanted to hear about the the. Uh, maintenance facility upgrade and I used to ask a question I, I just the simple question I go how many people have alternative fuel vehicles and everybody raise your hands you know these guys are really excited they've got that and then I I would ask again well how many have their own fueling station so some people would raise their hands I said well how many people have converted their maintenance facilities so you can repair it was like it was just an echo in the room nothing so so these are the things that I wish they had tar started talking about early on and we still have pushback, but I'll guarantee you, you have so many employees working within those facilities. You've got 
all of these guys, and it's it's if it's your responsibility, it's your responsibility to make them safe. That starts with your local authority. You both understanding exactly what it is you're trying to do, and uh, and go from there. No, I appreciate that, guys. Um, let's see another question on the meant the very brief mention of indoor fueling. Um, how is, are there separate requirements for indoor fueling versus indoor maintenance in an FPA? You better feel this one, Mark, because I know it. Okay. NFPA, okay. Well, know. actually, <laughs> actually, it says, and and we because we did have an argument about this, and there, it's it states that that if a fueling facility should be done just for that, but if you have a designated area, because we we do have indoor fueling here, uh, the the repairs aren't to be done in that same area that you're fueling is. So if you have a building and, and you clean the bus at one end and, and you go, you know, you do whatever maintenance on it and then you take it to your fueling area which is still inside, they deem to think that that's okay. But they, the, but the actual code says that, that the purpose is to, for fueling only. So uh, again, that's, that comes right back to your local authority on how he looks at it. And again, all of that falls under NFP 52, correct Mark? Yep, 52. So. Excellent, excellent. Um, let's see. Oh, and we also had an observation too on the radiant heaters. You guys made mention of it being rated up to 750 Fahrenheit, and so someone raised the alarm just to be sure there are some radiant heaters that will go hotter. So it's important to bear that in mind before you buy a wrong heater. Cannot. Yeah, so it says nothing. What makes them, nothing, yes. nothing to exceed 750 degrees. So if you're you're Element is is a, uh, able to do that. It would not be uh, CNG compliant. CNG compliant. Excellent, excellent. So very good. Let's see. Still going through a little bit. Um, one question too on if slides will be available for later. We are recording this, so we will have the webinar up there, and so we will be able to share that out with folks. Um, and all of you, Mark invited you to Los Angeles, so come on out. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm Absolutely. serious. Hey, we, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how many people do. We've had them from all over the United States. We've had them from all over the world. We come from China and and different parts of Europe, and they they come here. And some of our facilities, just to let you know, are huge. So we're we're presently not only we have 141 conventional gas stations, we have four. Uh, largest in the world liquefied natural gas facilities, 10 large compressed natural gas facilities, so we fuel uh, 284 LNG vehicles a day, 533 CNG vehicles a day, and then we have some dual fuels that are still running around, there are another 150 of those. So, so uh, yeah, we, there's, there's, there's a lot of fuel and a lot of maintenance going on for all these vehicles. No, it's outstanding. Here in Ohio, I know a lot of folks, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of CNG and LNG deployment both, and in turn, we've definitely looked to your example, Mark, on, on ways to deploy. So, uh, so no, definitely. And, and also, I, you know, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't re-stress the point. As you're looking at these deployments and build-outs, please be sure to be working with your local authorities. Um, okay. Here in Ohio, we had a recent victory on with regards to fire suppression with CNG refueling infrastructure, uh, but this was all about you know setting a, as common a standard as possible because in many ways we just always default to that local authority. So even if you're thinking about doing this before you start making any moves, please do meet with your local authority. It can't be stressed enough. Um, it's, it's as much an education of yourself as it is of them, too, so that they're familiar with the technology. Um, and so you can't be stressed I'll enough. Add, I'll add one thing to that for you, is that when we did start this out, we actually ended up with, a, a, ours is the local fire department, so we had a letter of agreement, meaning we sat down and we discussed this as we were going to comply with this code and we were going to do it this way. And so every every facility that we do, we base it upon a sequence of operations. So it's however, whatever event happens, what the sensor does, what what the fans will do, what the alarms will do, you know, evacuation procedures. So these are the things that if you go with them with this information up front and you're a little more knowledgeable, then you can have a discussion rather than them just dictating to you what it is you want to do. So.
Very good. Well, we don't have any additional questions. Uh, I guess, is there anything parting from uh, either of you, Mark or Corey, that if anything, no. what's the next, uh, what would be the next thing people would want to tend to? Well, that's a good comment. I, I think the exciting part is that Mark has, uh, has got now 19 years of experience in the, in the natural gas world. We talk about cost of ownership of systems, but I, I, if Mark would share a little bit about how much savings are, if, if they've seen savings by going to natural gas, um, and some of the advantages by going to natural gas in the city of Los Angeles, even though we were actually mandated um, by the EPA, right. Um, right. it still doesn't mean that we we did gain some things out of it. So, yeah, talk, talking with uh, the South South Coast Air Quality Management District uh, basically dictated that any fleet that had more than 15, especially municipalities that had more than 15 vehicles, they will not replace their diesel with diesel. So we we chose liquefied natural gas and compressed natural gas, and that's what we did. And in the beginning, everybody thought we were crazy because we're looking at LNG as five dollars a gallon, and and people think we're nuts. Well, now we today we pay we pay 92 cents a gallon delivered. So uh, so we've moved in the right direction, uh, we, we think. And what's really nice is as these vehicles drive through the neighborhoods and everything, they're quieter, they're cleaner, the, the, the neighborhoods love it. So well, the those are just that, <laughs> and, and the mechanics, because now you're talking a cleaner burning vehicle, everything's a little bit different, uh, you know, and, uh, and they're, they're, it, it's, the quietness between a diesel and the and the compressed natural gas vehicles is, is pretty incredible. That's all I well, got, Matt. Excellent. That's all I have. Well, thank you again, guys, for tuning in. Um, hopefully, this was definitely educational to all attendees. Uh, we're actually going to keep the natural gas theme rolling. Our webinar for next month, which is going to be on October 17th at 1 p.m. East Coast time, we're going to be having Kinetrix Energy on to speak on LNG. They are an LNG provider and work with a lot of those large LNG fleets. So it's a very fascinating presentation. Um, definitely, you know, a lot of folks are immediately talking on CNG, but uh, actually to Mark's point with regard to the LNG discussion, there's definitely those moments where a fleet would would be worth looking into uh, LNG as well. Oh, for so sure. De definitely. Well. Definitely. <laughs> Excellent. Could, that, well, that could be a whole nother discussion. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So we look forward to seeing folks uh, at that October uh, discussion. But with that, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you to Mark and Corey for going uh, very much in depth here. This, this actually was educational for myself just to learn a little bit more about how to manage facility. Uh, again, we'll have this recording posted out. If you do uh, want to follow up with anyone, feel free to contact the Clean Fuels Ohio office and we can get you in touch. Thank you Thanks, again, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.